Everyone listening to this show knows what happened at Appomattox Courthouse, or at least they do in April 1865. But the place was there long before and long after. We'll take the long view of a dot in the Virginia countryside when we return with William Marvel on Civil War Talk Radio. On Sound Authors, you can expect the unexpected. Kent Gustafson, Ph.D., author, publisher, professional musician, and now talk radio show host, will not only entertain you, but with new books and guest authors from around the world, will interview talented, independent musicians showcasing their fresh new music. Plan to join Dr. Kent and friends each Friday morning at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern, on World Talk Radio Studio A. Sound Authors, where authors sound off. What's it like? What's it like? It's lonely. It's really lonely. I miss my brother. I miss my brother. I'm surrounded by other people, but it's not the same. I've got other people around me, but it's not the same. It's pretty scary, but I don't let it rattle me. It's pretty scary around here, but I don't let it rattle me. You always have to watch your back. There's no one to watch my back. I spend my whole day worried who's out to get me. I'm always wondering who's out to get me. But I can take care of myself. But I can take care of myself. No matter what, I'll keep my head up. No matter what, I'll keep my head up. It's not like I have a choice. It's not like I have a choice. This will all be over in five years, three months, and 17 days. This will all be over in five years, three months, and 17 days. Go to jail for a gun crime and your family serves a sentence with you. Something to think about before committing a gun crime. Gun crimes hit home. This message brought to you by Project Safe Neighborhoods and the Ad Council. Once upon a time, there lived three energy hogs. Now, an energy hog is what you have when humans waste energy. One day, the three energy hogs set out to find themselves a cottage. Let's look for leaky windows, said the first energy hog, for he knew that would waste energy. Let's look for leaky doors, said the second. Let's look for a swing set, said the third, for he had more blubber than brains. So they set off down the road. Presently, they came upon a tiny cottage where dwelled a clever girl named Dreadylocks. I hope it has leaky windows, cried the first energy hog. I hope it has leaky doors cried the second. I hope it has the bathroom, cried the third, for only his brains were smaller than his bladder. But Dreadilocks liked playing cool games at energyhog.org, and from energyhog.org she learned how to use energy wisely. So the three energy hogs were forced to look elsewhere to waste energy, and had to use the disgusting restroom at the gas station down the road. And the moral of the story is, to use energy wisely, log on to energyhog.org, or waste not, hog not. This public service message brought to you by the U.S. Department of Energy and the Ad Council. World Talk Radio, bringing the world to you. Welcome back to Civil War Talk Radio. I'm Jerry Prokopovich. Our guest today on the show is William Marvel, author of numerous Civil War books, including one uh, I'd like to ask a question or two about right now called A Place Called Appomattox. Uh, Bill, this book uh, just crossed my desk in paperback form, newly reissued by uh, uh, Southern Illinois University Press. The original was University of North Carolina Press in 2000, and now there's a nice, uh, very handsome new paperback edition. Um, uh, first, uh, a publishing question. How how did it come about that this book uh, suddenly be- becomes resurrected from uh, uh, from one publisher's hardcover to another one's paperback? Well, when I first started um, publishing with uh, the University of North Carolina Press, uh, everything was, uh, well, it wasn't exactly done on a handshake, but things were more informal. And w- Was uh, that Lewis, um, uh, what was the name, uh, the, the Civil War editor there? Uh, well, the, the, the uh, I guess he'd be the uh, director is who I dealt with originally was um, Matt Hodgson. Okay. Uh, is that who you were thinking of? No, there, there was, um, uh, uh, boy, I can't think of his name. Uh, well, Lewis. A, I've was... worked with Ron Maynard uh, there, and uh, they're all good, good folks. But yeah. uh, I, I stuck with a university press uh, when I had uh, opportunities to uh, go to commercial presses instead because I was looking at the long term and 
and figuring that uh, these books would be available basically forever. Mm-hmm. And uh, that was uh, uh, that wasn't a uh, a promise, but it was certainly. Uh, uh, suggested to me as an argument for uh, staying with the university press. I've heard that argument too. Yes, well, that argument is by the boards. Uh, um, although some of my other books are going into uh, paperback, there, uh, this one, which I thought was really one of my best books, uh, if not the best, perhaps, uh, at least in uh, subject matter. Uh, this one, they they decided to let go and. Uh, and so uh, the uh, the book itself went to another publisher, and so did I. Uh, well, I, 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 my first book was with UNC Press, and I've uh, the current one is with a, a commercial press, but uh, not based on the same reasons. It was just a thought that I uh, might strike a broader audience one time with a mm-hmm. particular topic. But this. Um, uh, a place called Appomattox, uh, in in the new paperback form, as I said, is very handsome, and they're they're promoting it enough to uh, have taken the time to send me a copy, and I I really enjoyed it. I, I thought the the concept of looking at this village that everybody who listens to the show knows about as the site of Lee's surrender, uh, to do a history of of the village before uh, and after, as well as during the war, it was just a fascinating concept, and and uh, well, it. It uh, struck me as uh, uh, a means of, uh, of using a well-known microcosm as opposed to another. Um, I was uh, not. I was probably wrapping up the manuscript when I uh, realized that Daniel Sutherland had uh, written Seasons of War uh, about Culpeper County, mm-hmm. which was basically the, the same idea. And. Uh, um, and I and so mine followed his and and probably looked like imitation, but uh, it uh, it was a concept that uh, apparently more than more than one person thought uh, interesting. Well, it, but it works. First of all, as you say, by having uh, the hook of being a place where something actually does happen. I mean, I mean, there are books, classics like like Sugar Creek by by John MacFarger that uh, uh, looks at a little village, uh, a frontier community. In the Midwest, it's it's a great community study, but you know nothing ever happens there. Mm-hmm. Or um, uh, the, the famous New England uh, uh, books. What was the um, what was it? Was it Dedham? The the, the, the story of the hundred, first hundred years of a New England town. It was a, a, everybody had to read it uh, thirty years ago in, in, in history programs. Mm-hmm. Um, these, these town studies are, are, are very fashionable, uh, have been for a long time, but nothing ever happens. There, there's no narrative to speak of because they're like every other American village. In yours, uh, the whole time the reader knows where the story is going, that there's going to be a major event here, and, and it's a hook to keep you interested uh, throughout. And then you realize as you go that you're actually interested in all these characters that you you. you I almost said create, uh, but it's not fiction. <laughs> um, well, in in some cases, uh, uh, their descendants have claimed that I did. Ah, <laughs> uh, well, that, that's uh, people don't always care for that. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, with increasing age and responsibility, my memory is just fading, and, and that that New England book um, is just driving me nuts now. The subtitle was uh, "The First Hundred Years of a New England Town," and the story I remember about that one uh, was that the local, the Dedham Historical Society, uh, didn't have that book available because the the locals didn't care for it. It's the only right. serious historical book on the town. Well, uh, but but the people there, they they don't locals don't want really their history. They want their heritage. You have to know um, that uh, my book was uh, uh, not available at the Affirmatics Bookstore for a long time too. Really. And, uh, in fact, I'm told that uh, although they kind of keep a, a, a copy on hand, that uh, a number of people have gone in asking for the, for it and have been told that uh, they don't have it. Well, that, that's most unfortunate. I'm, I will be in, in Farmville tomorrow for a seminar. and uh, Well, I'm sure Pat Schroeder can fill you in. I'll, I'll talk to him. I'll, I'll although it will be uh, from the National Park perspective. Yes. Well, that... that now... I suppose I can can see you from the local perspective because as I was reading 
uh, this book, which, which for, for the listeners who haven't had, had the treat of reading it yet, uh, traces Appomattox from, from its founding as a sleepy rural community through its attempt to become uh, something bigger, maybe through the canal, maybe through uh, stage road, maybe eventually through the railroad. Uh, never quite takes off, but uh, uh, it's populated by characters who are always looking for the main chance, always speculating, hoping something will grow. Uh, Much like uh, any small town in, in the United States. Really, anywhere, very well, much so. Um, well, certainly. I mean, there are there are uh, how many towns in uh, Kansas? Uh, the town of Indianola, Kansas, um, was vying with Topeka five miles away uh, for uh, for dominance. And when the railroad went five miles south, Indianola disappeared. It's now the site of the Goodyear rubber plant. Uh, and and uh, th- that's true of so many towns. I lived in Fort Wayne, Indiana, which as late as World War II was vying with Indianapolis to be the the leading city of the state but it took a wrong turn somewhere um uh, it did or or it, some means of transportation did well, actually, that's yeah, what it, happened it, to appomattox the railroad it, exactly in fort wayne it was the interstate which they they built around instead of through and that yes yeah, so i just it. went around that uh, last year on my way from uh, from indianapolis to uh, ann arbor and and that's what people do they they do go around they take i-69 and just whiz right by um uh, just last week on uh, Prairie Home Companion, which I do not listen to uh, regularly, but they were from uh, Minnesota, from one of the state university branches in a small town that was at one time as big as Minneapolis. But uh, again, uh, things change. So things change in Appomattox, and it never becomes the big uh, tobacco center or anything it hopes to be. I, as I was reading it, it struck me that you... I got the feeling you didn't much like a lot of the people you you, you were telling us about in that town. Is that well, fair to say? Um, that that may be true. Um, first of all, it was uh, it was the uh, sort of culture in which the uh, uh, which is not to say that ours is any different. Uh, in which those with the uh, the most money continue to make the most money, usually on the backs of those with the least money, and. Uh, and through at least the first uh, 20 years or so of uh, Appomattox County's existence, that was literally true. Um, but there were, uh, I mean, there, it was the first time that I discovered uh, that there was a great deal of uh, military service avoidance in the Confederacy. Uh, like everyone else, I had supposed that uh, nearly every able-bodied Confederate had served uh, in the Army. And uh, yet I found that that was not true, that the richest were able to basically buy their way out there as well as in the North, um, and uh, that they uh, they capitalized on the, uh, on the war there uh, as much as uh, Northern uh, uh, speculators did. So... Yes, there were a lot of people there I didn't like, I, uh, but perhaps I have a little um, prejudice against um, that sort of entrepreneurialism. I, I grew up in a tourist town that was basically destroyed by rich people coming in and uh, doing as they pleased with it, and uh, so so maybe that's uh, partly personal. Well, that, that could be understood. Um, I, I recall hearing from... Uh, uh, one of the the guides at, at Gettysburg, I think, it may have been uh, uh, possibly Gary Crick. Uh, the the three seasons of the 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 people who visit the town in May, there are the tourists, and uh, by midsummer there are the damn tourists. By the end of the summer, it's the goddamn tourists. <laughs> uh, well, we go a little farther here, but I don't believe I can do it on the radio. <laughs> Well, uh, so in, in Appomattox, you've got these these people who, as you say, are very entrepreneurial. Um, I, I guess uh, Samuel McDermott, McDermott, sort of the, yeah. the McDermott, is, is the the poster boy for for what you're talking about. <laughs> uh, someone who who just speculates and tries all kinds of things to make money, never succeeds, mm-hmm. but has a great social reputation, political power, and when the war comes, he takes his honorary militia title and pulls every string he can to avoid actually serving the Confederacy. And ultimately became a, a revenue, a tax revenue um, collector. So so he ends up 
profiting from the war, but not contributing to the war. And, yes, and I, I don't recollect exactly how much he profited from it, but uh, he certainly didn't lose much. No, and and and, and I would say you're you're without ever using a harsh adjective, your uh, contempt is not too strong. Your contempt for the, the people who do this uh, emerges from this. At the same time, the other thing that I found really striking about your account was the, uh, the ever-presence of death, the, the uh, well, plagues and diseases that, that decimate the village before the war, and then, of course, the war itself. Well, that's, that's 19th century life. Uh, I'm finding the uh, the same things in uh, in the north, um, and as at Appomattox or, or in the Appomattox book, I uh, that particular Appomattox book, I um, found uh, I've, I'm finding that northern soldiers were bringing diseases home too. Um, right now, I'm I'm on the third volume of a four volume history of the war, and I've just passed the uh, reenlistment furlough period. And uh, I found that that was um, uh, that it was uh, coincidental with uh, an increase in um, fatal diseases uh, in many northern communities. And I suspect that that migration of soldiers from the army may have had something to do with it. Well, you know that makes perfect sense because we've all uh, read many times how the soldiers themselves, when they gather in these camps in 1861, uh, die from diseases because. They, they've grown up in isolated areas, and they haven't been immunized to various uh, various germs. But then, and then they get together with men from other parts of the the region or the state, and, and they get sick. But the idea that it would work backwards: the soldiers now are carrying these germs, and and, and maybe uh, are themselves immune to them. But they're going back to isolated communities in the north or the south. They would bring them with them, right? And they would, and people would get sick. I'd, that's a very striking observation. But, but that ubiquitous mortality is uh, is just uh, common to. Uh, I, I was uh, I borrowed the uh, Samuel Reader uh, diary from the Kansas State Historical Society recently, and uh, he was out there in the uh, late 1850s as a settler and uh, describes with uh, considerable nonchalance people who. Uh, uh, seemed in fine health uh, at the beginning of the month, and at the end of the month he uh, mentions that so-and-so died. Um, and uh, yet at the same time he mentions uh, repeated injuries to his feet and his toes, that any one of which could have led to gangrene. Uh, not gangrene, but... Uh, um, tetanus. Tetanus, exactly. Yeah. And, uh, and yet he escaped that, but uh, just by the luck of the draw. And that... Uh, that was just so common. I mean, you, you had 12 or 14 children because you wanted four of them to live, to grow to adulthood. Well, that, that also comes out in your account that when the, the soldiers from Appomattox, and many of the young men do enlist from Appomattox, uh, and they go off and fight, and when they come home, uh, just about the first thing they all seem to do is get their wives pregnant. Mm -hmm. uh, and then that is happening in the North as well. I um, I found a, uh, I edited the letters of a, a sailor from the Monitor uh, who came home and he had been uh, making uh, making numerous uh, euphemistic remarks to his wife about uh, what he planned to do. And uh, then after he came back, he uh, was writing anxiously, trying to uh, make sure that he hadn't done it. Uh, well, that, that uh, I mean, it's certainly a natural impulse obviously but but the 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 in frequency with which uh first of all with which women deliver children and then with which children and adults die is is different it it i was another book i was reading at the same time was one of gordon ray's books on the overland campaign mm -hmm. um which i had started before i interviewed him on the show a few months ago and uh sometimes i'll start a book to interview and not get a chance to finish, or sometimes with relief put it down and not have to finish. Um, his was one I wanted to finish, and I was struck by the, the number of casualties, uh, and, and almost like, I wouldn't call it casualness, but the the, the way the soldiers described uh, the person at their right and left falling over without a sound. Uh, you expect them to be inured to death after four years of it, but your account makes it clear that civilian life is pretty darn dangerous, too. Yes. Yeah. Everybody's dying. Um, and the uh, uh, one of the 
things that comes to light when uh, these soldiers are home for their 30-day furlough and then go back for three more years uh, is the concern that their wives have. Um, not that uh, they're not so overtly afraid that they're going to be killed in battle. They're afraid that over the course of three years, there's enough opportunity to die in any case mm. that uh, they they half expect never to see them again. Well, and that's not, not unlikely. Well, we're going to take another short break. We'll be back in just a moment. Uh, talk more with our guest, William Marvel. I'm Jerry Prokopovich, and this is Civil War Talk Radio. 